Oppression, a prolonged cruel or unjust treatment or exercise of authority. Living in the West means that many individuals from the Muslim community must often face oppression due to Islamophobia and the rejection of the religion of peace, Islam, by the society. Similarly, Fatima Zahra alayhi salam had to battle oppression against the Meccans. Many individuals today use her as a guide to speak out against oppressive individuals within Western societies and their false perceptions of Islam. I hope to investigate the aspects that are often neglected surrounding the life of Fatima Zahra alayhi salam and to understand the idea presented in both the Shi'i and Sunni school of thoughts. Did Fatima Zahra alayhi salam go through oppression to shape the people of this day and age? Is there a story behind her death? And is there a reason for her grave to be hidden? The great wound of Islam, Fatima Zahra, peace be upon her, is the greatest and best lady that Allah had ever created on this planet Earth. She is the chief of the women of the world, Sayyidat Nisa al Alameen, Salamullahi alayha. Now, with regard to her martyrdom and shahada, there are different sources in the Islamic books and textures in which indicates that this great lady was murdered and killed and she did not pass away naturally a normal death. She passed away in the age of 18, so young and she was in her best health. Now, if we begin with the sources of the non-Shia scholars, i.e. the Ahl sunnah when they clearly mention this calamity, this tragedy against the house of the Prophet of Allah, the house of Ahl Bayt salam, this divinely house of Ahl Bayt salam, in which was attacked Ahl Bayt salam, they have the sanctity and the asma and purity no one has the right to enter without their permission but sadly the enemies of Ahl Bayt, they entered without the permission of Ahl Bayt and they did what they did as a result. Let's begin with the narrations of the non-Shia, i.e. the Ahl Sunnah scholars. So we begin with one of the scholars in the third century of Hijrah. Tariq al-Tabari, for example, in his third volume, he mentions clearly the attack on the door of Fatima alayhi salam. He says that, I'll just take part of the narration. Da'a bil wa A person called for uh, the wood to be gathered and to be brought before the house of Fatima alayhi salam. And he said, والله لتحرقن عليكم أو لتخرجن إلى البيعة. He said, I swear by the one who owns my soul, this house will be burned over you, or you come out and you give the pledge of allegiance, the بيعة. فيقال إلى الرجل إن فيها فاطمة. They say to that, to that man who threatened to burn the house of Fatima alayhi salam that in the house there is Fatima. فيقول وَإِن He responds, so what? Even though I will burn it. He was insisting on burning the house of Fatima alayhi salam and he did so. In the other narration, 
historical narration by another scholar from the Sunni sect with the name of Ibn Qutaybah in the book of al Imama wa Siyasa. He again mentions the attack on this sacred door. He mentions in, in, in his first volume, Fada'a bil Hatabi waqal. Again, he calls for the wood to be gathered and brought before the door of Fatima alayhi salam. وَالَّذِي نَفْسُ عُمَرْ بِيَدِهِ لَتَخْرُجَنَّ In this narration, he brings the name of the person who ordered to burn the house of Fatima, and that is Umar, according to this Sunni scholar, Ibn Qutayba in uh, Al-Imam wa Siyasa. وَالَّذِي نَفْسُ عُمَرْ بِيَدِهِ لَتَخْرُجَنَّ أَوْ لَأَحْرِقَنَّهَا عَلَى مَنْ فِيهَا He threatens that either you come out, or if you don't, then I will burn the house over whoever is inside it. And then the historian, he brings the name Umar, that he threatened to burn the house over Ahl Bayt and over Fatima. Salamullah alayha. Indeed, Allah is angry when Fatima gets angry and is pleased when Fatima is pleased and satisfied. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's anger is when she is angry and she is satisfied and pleased then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also pleased and satisfied with the satisfaction and rida of Fatima alayhi salam. Great hadith, great narration and it is narrated in Sahih al-Bukhari, one of the most important uh, Sunni books that Allah has, gets angry in one side, uh, if Fatima gets angry and he gets his satisfaction and, and pleased when Fatima is pleased. And then in the same book, Al-Bukhari mentions that Fatima alayhi salam, she passed away while she was angry on Abu Bakr. And Fatima matat wahi wajid ala Abu Bakr. Imagine. So if Fatima is angry, then Allah is angry. So if that, that person, Fatima is angry on that, upon that person, then would that person deserve to be in paradise? The Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him and his pure family, states with regard to his daughter Fatima, peace be upon her, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَيَغْضَبْ لِغَضَبْ فَاطِمَةَ وَيَرْضَى لِرَضَاهَا Sheikh Abbas Panju is an English lecturer that recites lectures regarding the tragedies of the Ahl al-Bayt. I spoke to him to analyze the oppression of Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam and to understand her stance within the Muslim community. In regards to the decision of Sayyidah Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam to be buried at night, um, whether she chose to be buried at night uh, as, a, as a gesture of modesty uh, this is a notion that can, this is a notion that is not entirely accurate. What we do understand from historical text is that during the times of uh, Jahiliya, when, whenever a death used to happen, and particularly the death of a woman, her funeral procession, you know, her dead body, even though it would be covered up in a shroud, it would be placed on something like an open stretcher and then taken to the graveyard for burial. So therefore all the people attending the funeral procession would, uh, would have a glimpse at the body and even though it was covered in a shroud, it was very possible in the way that the woman's body or in the way that any dead body is wrapped within the shroud, the features of a body may become uh, evident. The, the shape of the body, the length of the body, all these things become very apparent for all the people that are there. And what we do know is that Sayyidah Fatima Zahra salam, was at the peak of modesty and was at the peak of hijab such that she, like the way she was unseen and just like the way she was, uh, she was uh, the manifestation of modesty, and, uh, and the hijab in its entirety, she was absolutely concerned about in the event of her death, she did not want uh, to be the object of everybody's eye. 
uh, in order for people to see her body. And just like the way she had remained covered while she was alive, she wanted to remain covered even after her death. And on this basis, she asked Asma bint Umais, and she told her that in the event of my death, I would like for you to construct for me like a coffin, such that if her body was placed in the coffin, she would be protected and people would not be able to see her body in that way. So when we talk about modesty, um, the, uh, the issue of modesty is in regards to the construction of a tabut or a na'ash or her blessed body being put in a coffin such that the general people from the Sahaba and them would not see her, her actual uh, physical body. But the reason for Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra insisting on being buried at night in the darkness of the night, this is in this in itself resembled a protest. The decision of Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra to be buried at night was a protest. And we understand this from historical texts. So if we refer back to the text, and I read this to you by way of example to assert our point, um, this is found in the text Rawdatul Wa'idin and in Biharul Anwar and the same indication is made in Ilal al-Shara'ih, in Kitabul Manakib, in Kitabul Misbah, uh, Kitabul Kafi of Sheikh al kulaini and the Amali of Sheikh Mufid. The narration goes like this. Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra is talking to Amir al-Mu'minin Ali ibn Abi Talib giving her the final will where she says to him, O seeker, an la yashhadu ahad, an la yashhad ahadun janazati min haula illadhina dhalamuni wa akhadu haqqi fa innahum aduwi wa adu rasul Allah. She says to him, I give you my final wish, my, yani my final wasiya, my final testimony that my will is that no one should be allowed to come to my funeral from amongst those who oppressed me and from amongst those who usurped my right. For indeed, she goes on to say, they are my enemies and the enemies of Rasulullah. So we understand the fact that Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra was buried in the night and the fact that Nobody except from four or apart from four or five who are approved by Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra. None of the Ashab of Rasulullah attended the funeral of the only daughter of Rasulullah. And she used this as a form of protest. She goes on to say, وَلَا تَتْرُكْ أَن يُسَلِّ عَلَيَّ Or she goes on to say, وَلَا يُسَلِّ عَلَيَّ أَحَدٌ مِّنْهُمْ وَلَا مِنْ أَتْبَائِهِمْ I do not want any of them, neither do I want any of their followers to pray over my, my body. She did not want them to be a part of their funeral prayers, of her funeral prayers, Salatul Mayyit. She did not want them to be a part of the burial process as a protest for the injustices that they performed against her. She requested Amir al Mu'minin as a part of a final will to be buried in the darkness of the night and, no, and to not allow any one of those people who oppressed her and those who followed the oppressors. She did not want even those people who were neutral in this issue of her right and the oppression of Amir al-Mu'mineen, none of them to be present at her funeral as a way to protest of this great injustice that was done to Islam. Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra's oppression um, in the sense that upon the martyrdom of Rasulullah, this land of Fadak that was gifted to her by the Holy Prophet of Islam upon the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the ownership of this land was usurped from her. And the people who were employed to work on that land were then taken away from this land and total ownership of the land of Fadak was taken. Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra appealed this decision and appealed this, this move and she categorized this as an injustice and an act that is contradictory to the teachings of the Qur'an. 
in terms of even through the door of inheritance. So therefore, when we talk about the oppression of Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra, it is not a personal issue over a personal inheritance between her and Abu Bakr uh, ibn Abi Kuhafa. La, this is an issue that symbolizes oppression against an individual, A, who is infallible, and the nature of the injustice is that it is a violation of the Quran itself. So when Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra comes forward with her oppression or fights the case for her oppression, it is only because it denotes the fact that a person who claims to be the Khalifa of Allah, the Khalifa of Rasul Allah, this person, despite this claim, is trampling upon the teachings of the Quran. So Fatima al-Zahra salam's oppression this is what it symbolizes. Her oppression symbolizes the oppression of Amir al muminin in the fact that his rightful position as the Khalifa of Allah and the Khalifa of Rasulullah, this position was usurped from him. The oppression of Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra denotes the oppression of Amir al muminin the, the oppression of Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra denotes the oppression of Rasulullah. The oppression of Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra symbolizes the oppression of the religion. The fact that she was oppressed denotes the fact that Islam as a religion was hijacked at that time. And therefore, we see the seriousness of this issue because of the implications of what happened in regards to the religion. Despite the circumstances she faced, she remained strong and stood firm in her protest and demonstrates the attributes necessary for us to respond to various types of aggressions in a manner befitting a perfect Muslim. Many use her as a moral model in the way they conduct themselves in both positive and negative situations. I met up with sister Leila Mehdi to learn the effect of Islamophobia on her as an individual and how society perceives her. Have you ever faced oppression by the Western community because of your beliefs or because of how you dress maybe? Um, so it's, it's, uh, there's been around 37 uh, attacks since 2014 uh, done by ISIS. And these are always portrayed in the media as um, something done by by Muslims and Islam, and, and they always show pictures of, of a hijabi or a bearded man. Even if you put in on Google just um, ISIS attacks, the first hit you will get up will be um, a Wikipedia page, and it's called Islamic Terrorism in Europe. Mm -hmm. It's literally referred to as Islamic. So, the, like, your, your religion is suddenly linked to something so negative like terrorism and um, like just skipping the whole discussion about whether it's true or not or whether there are Muslims or not all of that at the end of the day this is a type of oppression because it is affecting a whole community but it's also affecting us as individual one individuals one by one um, like I remember when the Brussels attacks happened uh, Brussels attack happened in 2016. I was at work and um, we first got the news. We were watching TV and uh, when we got the news, I felt like everyone was looking at me. And one of the people there said, how do you feel about this, Leila? And I remember like, it felt like I had to justify um, the situation. I had to justify what, what was done. And um, which in fact, it's not the case, but that, that's, um, that's a type of oppression, uh, just being misunderstood and um, mispresented. So you feel your hijab is like one of the reasons why it might, like it might emphasize on this oppression that you're facing or people, Muslim women in general? I mean, the hijab is the first thing anyone sees. It's literally like you're, you're bearing a flag that says, I'm Muslim. Um, for a man it's probably the beard but it's a bit more general for men because other religions can also have beard or like Sikhs can look like Muslims but for women wearing the hijab except for maybe nuns that might look similar mostly it will it will tell you that you're a Muslim and that will cause people to uh, to react in a certain way um, and it's 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 a very human thing that what, what you see 
um, you just connect the dots. So mm -hmm. you see, uh, you see, if you see terrorism, you see killing, you see blood, and then you see hijab, you see Islam, you see, you know, and that's why in your brain you will just connect this picture, this image of this person looking mm -hmm. like this, to something bad and to fear, and okay. maybe not educated people that have that maybe know a Muslim or have a Muslim friend or neighbor, but um, in general, there are people out there that might look at you and just get scared. Like if I give you an example of another situation, um, it was the rose event, the ca uh, rose uh, campaign, and I was giving a rose to a person and um, he said, no, I would never take a rose from a Muslim. And I said, but what's wrong with the fact that I'm Muslim? I'm just giving a rose to share happiness because it's the Prophet's birthday and it's Christmas. And, and he said, because you are, you're sharing an ideology that oppresses women and um, has terrorism. So he referred to my religion as an ideology, you know, mm -hmm. and it's just, it's all things um, negative. But you can, you cannot really, um, you can't say that it's their fault. It's also how the 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 media is portraying us. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like if I was in their position, I would probably also be fearful. Okay, so when you're like in these kind of cases and when you have to face, how do you apply Fatma Zahra alayhi salam in these matters? So what kind of aspects do you use from her to help you stand up to this kind of oppression? Fatima Zahra is like an, it's an inspiration, definitely. Um, I think in this situation, it is not to water down your beliefs. So what I mean by that is, um, it's so easy when you feel um, like the odd one out, or when you yes. feel like you're 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 looked at in a negative way. It's very easy to change yourself. It's very easy to to you know. Uh, watering down what you believe in, you know, changing your hijab, changing your, um, you know, the way you speak with people about your religion. Um, and maybe just internally as well, you know, being a bit less proud, being a bit more doubtful. Um, I think from Fatima al Zahra, what we can learn is how to stand up for what you believe in, believe in what you believe in. So for example, um, like when uh, when Fatima al Zahra, when Fedek was taken away from her, mm. she spoke up. She she had she has the the khutbah al which she, which is so known now, because she stood up and she said what she believed in. Uh, or when when they attacked her attacked her house and they had she knew they had the wa'in mentality. When, so what if Fatima al Zahra is there? We're still stronger. We can uh, we can beat her. We can swear at her. We can you know. We were more powerful. She knew they had that mentality, but she still stood up for what she knew was right. Um, when they dragged Imam Ali to the masjid and, and forced him to do bay'ah, uh, like, you know, she stood up, she, she went and spoke up. You know, even though she knew she was in the less powerful position in that moment, mm -hmm. she did not water down her belief. And I feel like we can so use that in our day yes, and age. We can, we can. Because of the negative light that is portrayed upon the religion, Muslims in many countries have become a subject of stereotypes based on their clothing or the way they act. Many of the Western societies tend to generalize Muslims to be terrorists, refusing to educate themselves about the true Islam that portrays nothing but peace and equality. Mainly, I faced oppression when I left university and I started looking for employment. And I was offered the opportunity to work abroad, teaching English to foreign students. And I was approached directly by this particular company and I said to them straight up that I'm a practicing Muslim. I observe the hijab, I pray five times a day, I do all the wajibats. So it wasn't a shock to the system for them, they already knew. But they said to me, oh no, that's okay, we, we respect people of all religions and all beliefs and cultures. So I wasn't worried and I, I got on a plane, I went over there and 
unfortunately from day one I was discriminated against very heavily to the point where I couldn't do the job that I was trying to do and even though I wasn't doing anything wrong and even though my students were they were progressing very well alhamdulillah they were so fixated on my faith on how I looked differently from them that in the end I had to walk away from that job. The one day I just turned to them and I said I'm not going to be treated like this and I left. I got on a plane and I came back home. When I arrived at the office in this particular country they took me in straight away and told me take off your headscarf. Now this was before I wore the abaya and the chador every day and I would just wear the scarf with western clothes and I was very stubborn. I said no, I told you about this to begin with and the fact that you are worrying so much about a scarf that's on my head when it's not going to affect how I am as a teacher and I and I was always going to be professional. I was never going to stand there and preach Islam to these children. That wasn't my job. The thing that I wanted to do was just teach them English. So yes, the, the hijab was a very central part. And the fact that I was very stubborn about it and I wouldn't compromise on it, they really didn't like that. And that was the beginning of kind of the, the end with that job as such. Fatima Sahra alayha salam, she, she's such an inspiration and a role model to me. And the fact she, she inspired me in that situation because I knew that she never compromised on her hijab. She loved her hijab and was devoted to it. For example, there's a beautiful narration that I, I'll never forget reading where where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi were early, he, he came up to Fatima to Sahra alayha salam and he said to her, My daughter, I saw that you had a blind man come and visit you and you put a curtain between him and you. Why is that? And she said to him, Ya Rasulullah, even though he is blind, I can still see him and he can smell my fragrance. So that is why I put the curtain between us, even though she was fully covered. And the Prophet ﷺ, he said, I testify that you are from me. And so many other ways Fatima to Sahra salam, during her life showed her commitment to the hijab. And probably one of the most powerful instances is when she was attacked in her own home and she stood behind the door, even though she was covered, but she didn't want the men to see her. That was the quality of her modesty and her shyness, her devotion to the hijab. Throughout my life, with many of the struggles that I've gone through, I've related to Fatima to Sahra a lot. Whenever I've been out on the streets and I've had people stare at me or I've had people say particularly rude comments. I remember how Fatima Sahra alayha salam, she went from being protected and loved by the people of Medina to being a shadow. The fact that these people who claim to be Muslims, some of them, they had the audacity to, to hit the face of Fatima Sahra alayha salam. And when I think of that and how brave she was in the face of that, it helps me to go out into society with my head held high. Because I think if the Lady of Light can do it, then I have no excuse. It is apparent that women face the brunt of the prejudice against Muslims. However, men also face stereotyping within their communities through their religious garb and the way they conduct themselves. With our knowledge of the prejudice that Shias face, individuals fear to express themselves as a follower of Imam Ali alayhi salam. Brother Minhal is an example of a male that has experienced negativity in his local community and used the lessons of Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam to address the way he approaches these situations. 
So I've been the subject of many threats in the community. For example, when um, uh, predominantly the area that I live in is surrounded by Wahhabi mosques. So, you know, you always have these people that stand around and give, they call it dawa. And some of them are pretty angry. And when they come up to you and they tell you, they, the first thing they ask you is, what's your name? And I think that's the main thing because when you have a Shia name, you sometimes when you have those people, you try to trying to conceal your name in front of them because you never know what they could do to you. So you know, I, th I feel like that's a kind of oppression that I've faced within the community. The name emphasizes on this oppression because when you look at my name and you know its origins, many of the enemies of the Shia school of thought. Um, don't like this name because of a certain personality that was loyal to Al Muhammad. Um, but when we talk about, for example, the Dijdasha and everything, other schools in Islam or even the outside community, for example, if we start with the other schools in Islam, their Dijdasha, it has to be above the ankle. Whereas for us, we tend to put it below the ankle because, you know, it doesn't look neat and tidy. Um, so, from there, they distinguish between a Shi'i and a Sunni. Um, the outside community, you know, they have this big stereotype of Muslims who wear these uh, dishdashe, who wear this dishdashe, you know, they stereotype them for a terrorist or someone who's going to do something. But, you know, you kind of have to deal with that by showing them that you're not that person that they see on TV. There's no doubt that the oppression of Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam breaks the heart of a believer. Uh, when we look at her miscarriage, when we look at how she was slapped, it, it angers the person inside. And when you have someone from the outside community coming and telling you that these people are good people, at first you get quite angry because you know what they've done, you know what they did after the death of the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family. But I also think that there's an element of where you need to educate them because sometimes they may not know what had happened. Their, their Imams in their mosques every Friday may not shed light on these kinds of topics. And I think also you need to be able to study their books in order to bring them direct evidence from their most trusted books and to prove your thoughts. So when we look at, for example, Surah 2, verse 153, it says, Indeed Allah is with those who are patient. Now, when Fatima al-Zahra was oppressed, and arguably it's one of the biggest of oppressions that anyone could ever face, she was patient throughout it, and she showed us that you know, Allah has a plan for everything. So I think patience is the key thing and educating the opposing party in order to shed light on your religion. Brother Mehdi Taqi, a youth lecturer in London, provides reasoning for the death of the Prophet's daughter and what we can understand of it today. Because I'm still young, I guess I haven't faced that much oppression from the outside community. It's probably because I haven't really had that much, you could say, exposure to uni life or to the workplace because I'm still young. However, there's always some form of oppression or some form of restriction, some may say, with the title or the label of being a Shia Muslim specifically. If you open the media or you see the news or you see anything, you always see that there's a lot of Islamophobia targeting Muslims, especially youthful Muslims who have to be integrated within our community. Every time you open the news, for example, you'll see a Muslim man killed him, a Muslim man killed her. And it hasn't really given us the best image. But this is when Fatima al-Zahra's life becomes a lesson for us. This is where Fatima al-Zahra's stand against injustice becomes something that we can relate to. So the same way that some may say that we are being restricted because of our beliefs, Fatima al-Zahra was also, they tried to restrict her. Fatima al-Zahra was this colossal figure in a society that didn't really want her, that didn't really want women specifically, that didn't want the daughter of the Prophet to be as successful or as influential as she was. However, one of the ways they tried to restrict her, for example, was they tried to take Fedek away from her. 
One of the ways they tried to restrict her was try by crushing her between the door and the nail. The, one of the ways they tried to restrict her was through their oppression and through their propaganda against her. However, what Fatima al-Zahra teaches us is that no matter how much you think you are restricted, no matter how much you think you're oppressed, you should always stand up for your own rights. Fatima al-Zahra went out, although she was a woman in that society, she went out and she stood up against all the, all the people who took Fadak away from her. And she gave a speech which must have rattled them, a speech which confused them. They had never seen anything like that before. So when we see these lessons from Fatima al-Zahra, when we see her bravery, we have no excuse anymore. We have no reason to not stand up against these injustices and this, um, this oppression that sometimes we may face. And this is where Fatima al-Zahra teaches us to stand up against anyone that tries to restrict you. Yes, I do believe that there was a reason for the death of Fatima al-Zahra as I believe that the deaths of all the Imams and all the actions that they undertook had a wisdom and had a reason behind it. As we know, our Imams are all infallible, therefore everything they did would have had a sort of lesson for us. And the lesson, in my opinion, that Fatima al-Zahra taught us was that she, she set the standards for what is right and what is wrong. If you see Imam Hussein many years later did the exact same thing. He went out to Karbala and he showed people who was right and who was wrong. He set a clear line between who was Shimmer and who was Imam al Hussein. He set, he set who was on the Haq and who wasn't on the Haq. And Fatima al Zahra had done that before. So nowadays, when we always get questioned, we always get scrutinized why do you follow these certain individuals? Why do you follow these certain people? Well, we'll tell them because they set, they set who was right, they showed us. Fatima al Zahra stood behind the door. And the Prophet said that Fatima Bad'atun Minni, Fatima is a part of me. And whoever angers her has angered me, and whoever's angered me has angered Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I asked them and I just wonder, how can we follow someone who has angered Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while the person that we follow was the one who was busy taking care of the Prophet's body, taking care of the Prophet's burial and of his death ceremony. So that's what Fatima al-Zahra stood for. She stood behind that door and she sent us a message and she, tes and she told us the barometer for who is right and who is wrong. Yes, I do believe it's very important to understand the reason for Fatima al-Zahra's death and one of these reasons that it was part of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's plan. So as we know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has planned everything and we, when we see the oppression that the Ahlul Bayt go through, we tend to be sometimes a bit confused about why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would put some people which he loves so much under so much oppression. The oppression that Fatima al-Zahra has gone through is a test to her from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a test to her to prove to everyone and to all the Muslims why she is the role model that we follow. Because if we, if we, don't, if we wouldn't have followed her, if she didn't die in that way, then these people who would have killed her, then these people who did oppress her would never be exposed. But now it's just set out. Fatima al-Zahra's whole message, Fatima al-Zahra's whole reason was to show the people who is right and who is wrong. And that's part of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's plan. As we know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who is all wise and the one who is all knowing. And he knows the plans and he sees the greater images that we can't see. And part of his image was Fatima al-Zahra. And maybe even we could say that the Fatima al-Zahra, uh, incident had raised the Shia that we are today. Maybe her incident had kick-started Karbala in a way. Maybe the Shia of Imam Hussein that had helped him that day, maybe Fatima al-Zahra, this incident had put that fire in their heart so that they have the love for the Ahl al-Bayt and that fire that was put, that was started back then is still in our hearts right now and that is why we love Fatima al-Zahra Oppression that Muslims face today can be seen in the life of Sayyida Fatima al-Zahra and dare I say can be traced to Arab history whether it is taking their right to wealth, their right to receive an education, even a right to a political opinion, Muslims can empathize with Sayyida Fatima Zahra alayhi salam. Sayyida Fatima showed us how to address those who may want to cause us harm and come to us with negativity. We stand up against injustice and stand firm with our beliefs. Fatima Zahra alayhi salam showed us how to rise to the occasion, take a stand and demand what is haq, and the youth of our generation can learn a great deal from the Lady of Light.